Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I don't think I need to introduce the RBI governor to you, but all of you know him, so we can get started straight away. Mr. Das, thank you very much for finding the time today. You need to take this if you mind. Yeah. The way the last one year has been, I just want to start by asking you, when you brush your teeth in the morning, do you see a few more extra gray hairs on your head? No, I attained uh, wisdom, I think, fairly early in life. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've been having this gray hair for quite a long time. So how many more has been added? I think uh, probably my friends from uh, Mumbai will be able to tell. But otherwise, it's always been like that. Has it been the most challenging year of your tenure? Or would you say the COVID year 2020 was more challenging? No, you know, every channel, every challenge in a particular context uh, becomes, uh, you know, it looks more challenging than the previous one. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were so many situations when I was a part of the government when we deal, dealt with a lot of uh, uh, very, you know, very a lot of challenges. When I came to RBI in December 2018, the entire 2019, the focus, primary focus, not just to one of the areas where we concentrated from RBI, but the primary focus in the financial sector was on the NBFC segment. Post-ILNFS, liquidity had uh, dried up. There was a you know, considerable undermining of uh, market confidence in the NBFC sector. So in that context, we had to really focus and see that the NBFC sector makes a comeback. So we very intensively focused on the liquidity situation in NBFCs, the bad asset situation in NBFCs, and I think by the end of 20, uh, 2019, we were almost coming to an end of that problem. Right. Then, of course, the war came in 20... Sorry, then, of course, the COVID came in 2020. 21 was Delta wave, and 22 was the war. So it's been <laughs> one challenge after the other. Exciting times for you, but... You know, you've, there's been a lot of talk of late of uh, monetary policy failure, the letter that have, you've written to the government, which none of us have seen. Uh, but I want to ask you if you think, on hindsight, you could have done anything differently. It's a hypothetical question. Hindsight is always 2020. But do you think you could have done anything differently or would have done anything differently in the last one year? I think we have been on the right path. Okay. That, that is our assessment. I mean, people can hold uh, different opinions. I'll tell you why. You see, the inflation, even during uh, 2020 later part, around uh, October of 2020, inflation had gone up. It had touched 6%. And there was market uh, expectation in some seg uh, segments of the market that RBI uh, will probably increase the rate. There was also, there were people who were saying that RBI should now turn the focus uh, to inflation and increase the rate. But our assessment shows this, showed that going into January or so of 2021, the infl inflation will come down. And indeed, it, it came down. Then 2020, 2021, again, in the latter part of 2021, the inflation was gradually going up. In the February MPC, you know, which was very critical. The inflation projection which we had for that financial, you know, for the next financial year, that is from 2021-22, for that financial year, our assessment of the average inflation was that it was going to be 4.5%. The professional forecasters in the market, their forecast ranged between 46 to about 5.2%. Whatever it is, inflation was going to be around in the worst situation, around 5%. We had done our scenario analysis assuming uh, crude at even higher prices at $95 per barrel, $100 per barrel. And we found that the inflation in the worst situation would be around uh, 5%. Now growth was recovering. We wanted a safe landing of the economy during the year 21-22. So in February, Contrary to, you know, what uh, somebody may say that, you know, RBI probably should have increased towards the end of, uh, you know, uh, around, let's say, December uh, uh, 21 or uh, February 22. Uh, somebody may say that. But the point is we wanted 
the economy to have a safe landing the recovery of the economy the gdp to be above the pre pandemic levels and uh, 21 22 growth was about 1.6% above the pre pandemic levels of uh, 1920 I'm giving a long answer, but no, no, I think it's a it very interesting necessary. answer. Please go ahead. It is necessary. So, economy was recovering. We wanted a safe landing for the economy in terms of the growth figures. And I think today, looking back, it gives us great satisfaction that last year the economy recorded, last year meaning 21 22, it was 8.7 percent. And for the current year, our projection, current year meaning, you know, 20, yeah, current year, 22, 23, our projection in RBI is 6.8%. The National Statistical Office has projected 7%. We will know uh, after March. So the economy has not only landed safely, the economy has resil remained resilient, notwithstanding this huge amount of global spillovers which are emanating because of the effect of the war geopolitics and the synchronized monetary policy tightening, especially by the U.S. Fed and other, other uh, advanced economies. Inflation, yes, it did go up to 7% after reaching a peak of 7.8% in April, you know, April 22. It has come down. In between, it went up once for 7.4 or so. Now, December figure were released yesterday. It was 5.7. It has come down from 5.8 to 5.7. It's mainly due to softening of food inflation. I do concede that point. But, so therefore looking at this, now the law mandates that RBI is supposed to, you know, the RBI Act, the law mandates that uh, uh, RBI has to maintain price stability basically meaning that maintain the inflation around 4%, keeping in mind the objective of growth. And I think we have kept the objective of growth, which had to be given primacy during pandemic times and uh, thereafter. We have not lost sight of the need to focus on inflation. So therefore, when the war started and, uh, you know, the uh, international prices of commodities, even the food prices went up, prices of edible oil, prices of cereals also went up because of the war in Ukraine. So we, we did not hesitate to take uh, a decision in an off-cycle meeting last year in May. We were criticized for that. But it was necessary because we didn't want to give a big shock in our June monetary policy. So we split it. We did 40 basis point increase in uh, May and another... Uh, you know, we did another uh, 50 basis point increase. So even looking back, I think we have been on the right course. And uh, I think, uh, you know, the earlier uh, uh, theorists of being behind the curve, etc. I think that discussion on being behind the curve is, I think, is over. Okay. That's a long answer. Have we just... Very long answer, no, but, uh, no, I... thought, but it has to be, it had to be explained. <laughs> This long answer, have you just paraphrased your letter to the government? <laughs> you know, I have said it earlier. It's, uh, it's, an, you know, it's, a, it's an intelligent guess which everybody can make and I'm sure anybody else can make in this room. But broadly, yes, I think, in a way, yeah, in a way, manner of speaking, broadly, yes. Broadly, yes. <laughs> you spoke about this inflation targeting band. Would you go as far as to say, given the way inflation is moving and the kind of volatility in prices we are seeing globally, that whole notion of that target ban needs to be revisited today? I would not think so at this point of time. You know, the inflation targeting framework did facilitate maintenance of average CPI inflation at about 3.9% from 2016 when it was instituted, when it started, to the pre-pandemic uh, position in February 2020. So for those three years, almost three years, mm -hmm. the average inflation was 3.9%, close to 4%. After the pandemic, of course, the situation changed. Now, we have had, uh, you know, one after the other major shocks, the COVID, then the war, and uh, 
monetary policy tightening, the current volatility in the financial markets, etc. But I think it's too early to shift the goalpost. The 4% has a certain meaning. And also, let me add that our target of 4% plus minus 2% to declare it as a failure. If you exceed that, then only it's a failure. I think that gives us sufficient flexibility in our monetary policy decision making. We utilize this flexibility, the monetary policy committee, the MPC, utilize this flexibility embedded in the inflation targeting framework to tolerate higher inflation of 5%, 5.5%, and even more than 5.5%, up to 6%, because the requirement of that time when we were undergoing the stress of COVID and then the, you know, mostly the COVID impact during those two years, inflation, slightly higher inflation had to be tolerated because the economy required help. The economy required support. We had to infuse a lot of liquidity. We had to also do a substantial reduction in policy rates. So therefore, the current target of plus minus 2% gives enough flexibility, policy flexibility, to the Monetary Policy Committee. So keeping that in mind, I would feel that the 4% target with plus minus 2% is very robust. In the Indian context, I don't think there is any need for any change. Okay, you say that you would not have done anything differently, looking back. But when you look at the Federal Reserve's actions, I mean, I'm not asking to pass judgment on them, but as one central bank banker observing another central bank, would you say they made a mistake? No, it will not be fair on my part uh, to comment on another central bank. But we are all and, see, uh, there are no Americans in the audience. Yeah. No, no, we have a central bank community also. We meet every two months. <laughs> we meet every two months in Basel under the aegis of the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements in Basel. We meet every two months. Last week I was in, last weekend I was in Basel. We had a meeting. And there we have very free and frank exchange of uh, views and thoughts and, uh, you know, what, how we look at uh, each other. You don't think they should have pressed the trigger earlier, uh, the U.S. Federal Reserve? Given no, I would not like to comment on that. I think uh, uh, he's, he's the best judge where he is sitting. From outside, many things, you know, we can assume so many things from outside. Uh, we can form our own opinion. But ultimately, it depends on the person who is in the chair. He knows so many inside details and so many other, you know, angularities and details. And, you know, he, has, he is much better positioned to take a decision. So whether he was right or he was wrong, I think it's not proper for me to comment. Now the whole focus has shifted. I mean, earlier the, everybody's focus was on when the Fed will stop raising rates and when they will pivot, start cutting rates once again. But now everybody's saying it will be higher for longer. Maybe rates will remain at this elevated level in the U.S. for a very long time. But, and that is probably material to us as well because we can't function immune of what the U.S. Federal Reserve is doing. So what is your expectation of what might pan out there? No, I'll talk about the global situation and let me also qualify by saying that I'm not giving any uh, forward guidance or, a, or any indication about what the MPC is going to do in the first week of February. No, I'm, I'm not, not asked you that no, question I'm not either. I'm not asked. No, I'm not saying you don't take it as a forward guidance for the MPC's decision to be taken. But if the geopolitical conflicts continue, in the way manner they are at the moment, if the geopolitical cons uh, you know, situation uh, continues as it is, if there are no new flashpoints, because international geopolitics, if you see, there could be new flashpoints also. So if the current geopolitical crisis continues in the way it is, it could be a situation of uh, high for long with regard to interest rates world over. Including not, India. Not just, uh, not just uh, United States, but I think uh, world over. Now, including India, I will not say, I have said world over. India is part of the India world. India is sir. part of the world. But having said that, I would also like to add that notwithstanding the geopolitical tensions persisting, Every country, every system, human society knows how to adjust to a new situation. So global supply chains have considerably, you know, considerably eased out, 
compared to the you know the supply chain uh, uh, bottlenecks which were there there has been considerable uh, improvement in the global supply chain situation new alignments are being developed countries are you know looking at new sources of supply united states is looking at uh, there is this whole talk of china plus 1 United States is looking at a situation where the semiconductor supply they develop alternate sources that is alternate to uh, China yeah. so i think countries will find their way of improving the supply situation in which event there could be a moderation in the you know inflation numbers going forward and also it all depends on the kind of uh, uh you know the kind of slow down to what extent the the depth of the slow down that countries are going to experience 6 months ago the expectation around global slow down global recession was much more grim than it is today 6 months ago everybody thought that uh, there will be a recession in the european union i am not ruling out that possibility but it has improved considerably united states also looked as if they will face a recession uh, uh, you know a recession but united states also may avoid a recession and perhaps just have a growth slow down at best and maybe a mild or a soft recession for a very very temporary period so there are so many uncertainties possibility of a high for long is very much there but these are the you know these are the uncertainties these are the variables which uh, one has to factor in very difficult last line again very long answer the bottom line is that given the uncertainties one has to be prepared for all eventualities so if it is high for long you have not said it for india except that but i want to ask you you've raised repo rates five times uh, how long do you think it takes for the cumulative interest rate hikes that you've done a to be translated by the banking system and b to have the kind of effect that you had in mind while raising those interest rates how much time does it take in your eyes you see normally it takes about uh, minimum 7 to 8 months for the impact to really play out so far as inflation or any other uh, you know all other you know the outcome of any monetary policy tightening or monetary policy easing in the easing cycle the liquidity also if you you know because injecting liquidity is much easier so therefore from that angle the actual impact plays out faster, faster. in a tightening cycle pulling out liquidity takes time so therefore it takes that much more time so it takes at least 7 to 8 months for the impact to be felt in the our researchers in rbi of course it does not reflect the views of the rbi in the report on currency and finance Uh, which was done 2 years ago our researchers in rbi concluded that it will take about 4 uh, quarters for the impact to be felt one full year ha huh. that is what they sort of say that was their view uh, and they did not say it in that way they said it in the context of definition of failure of monetary policy instead of being 3 quarters it should be 4 four. Four quarters so in that context they had said but i would say that it would take about at least 7 to 8 months for it for the impact to be felt so should i infer that it could remain high for that long for you to have the desired effect no no let us say we take a decision today the impact of that decision will be felt 7 so months, months down, down the road right. okay <laughs> fine but do you think this is the right instrument mr das this is the important question because i was just reading an article by joseph stiglitz i'm sure you've read the same where he invokes maslow saying to a man with a hammer everything looks like a nail and he says that central banks across the world are using a sledge hammer approach to tame this variety of inflation and this is not the right instrument because it will have the opposite effect it will not bring down this kind of inflation on the other hand it will bring down growth now he's you may disagree with him but is there a grain of truth to what he's saying is i'd like to add two points given the fact that the current inflation is largely i mean to a great extent let me see it let's say that to a great extent it is supply side driven factors sure it's mostly supply side driven given that 
being of you know being the real situation that is prevailing today a coordinated action between the monetary and fiscal authorities is very important in the context of india i am happy to mention that there has been a coordinated action between the monetary and fiscal authorities the government has reduced the taxes on petrol and diesel twice you know twice during this period taxes uh, that is the import duties on import of pulses on uh, edible oil and several other food items have also been reduced there were some restrictions put on uh, steel exports mm. so there have been measures taken by the government with regard to the to deal with the supply side issues in the monetary policy side we have you know we have taken out lot of liquidity in fact i would say that uh, the problem of uh, we are all i mean we are through the chakra view we are out of the chakra view of liquidity we have increased the policy rates by 225 uh, basis points now central bank has to do it for two reasons one is to sober down the sober down the demand side let me not say contraction of uh, you know not, not let me not say compression of demand let me just say that rebalancing the demand and supply because if the prices are more obviously the demand is in excess of the supply, supply. so therefore you have to rebalance you have to balance supply and demand that is the first thing that the central bank uh, monetary policy action does the second thing which is very important is that it provides an anchor to inflation expectations inflation expectations i mean wide spread i mean large amount you know several uh, research in several countries have shown you will know very well that inflation expectations do play a major role in the future inflation trajectory if the market if the stakeholders in the economy feel that the central bank is tolerant of higher inflation what will it mean it will mean everybody will start pricing their products assuming that the inflation will remain at the current level or will go up further and the central bank will do nothing mm. so inaction on the part of the central bank will fuel further inflation expectations which in turn will be you know self fulfilling it will give further push to inflation so therefore central bank has a primary role in this coming to your point that you know it will it will sort of it will uh, you know it will sort of con it will lead to a contractionary situation it will slow down growth some amount of growth slow down can happen has to happen. but there is the policy challenge for the cent each central bank depending on their domestic context to keep in mind the requirements of growth up to what you know to what extent you can push the envelope up to what extent you can you know do it in the sense that it should not be totally detrimental to the you know growth objectives and detrimental to your uh, you know employment and your growth situation i use the word employment because in united states mostly it is you know they go by the employment numbers in countries like india we go by the growth numbers the gdp numbers how much sobering of demand are you expecting uh, mr das because you know a new credit cycle for the banking system has just begun uh, do you think it will be thwarted or reined in by this kind of moderation in demand because i was speaking to a banker this morning who made the point that they're still not seeing that kind of enthusiasm on the part of corporates to take up credit in a large way it's largely it's still retail you are right the credit growth so far has been largely retail in india in this cycle and uh, but my sense that i get from our interaction with bankers is that uh, they have started receiving proposals for wholesale credit and i do believe that given the importance which is being given by the policy authorities to let us say to renewables and to our several other sectors sectors like renewables there will be big demand for credit from the you know from the uh, domestic banking sector and lot of credit was availed by our domestic corporate houses particularly you know in the uh, you know during 2020 or 21 from the overseas markets mm. so 
they have met their funds requirement by going to overseas markets at that time. Now the focus is turning more towards the domestic segment, to the domestic meaning to our Indian banks, the banks in India, because there the rates have started going up and they are all pricing further increases and there is also uncertainty how much of increase US and other countries will do. So wholesale credit, I think uh, there are signs that it is picking up. Given the fact that our economy has held up very well and it remains uh, resilient, I think uh, going forward we should see, uh, you know, we should see uh, more of wholesale credit demand coming up. Investment cycle, you know, the current GDP growth is sustained mostly by, uh, mostly by consumption and by investment demand. But investment demand at till now has come from government uh, capex. The private capex cycle, I think, is showing some signs of improvement. And going forward, it should pick up further because uh, capacity utilization of the manufacturing sector, mm. our last survey for Q2 showed that capacity utilization for manufacturing sector is around 75%. Mm. Uh, even seasonally adjusted capacity utilization was around 75%. Services exports are doing very well. Domestic services sector are doing very well. So I think going forward, we should see some, you know, some pickup in wholesale credit also. You mentioned services, which reminds me that I wanted to ask you about on the point of inflation. Uh, do you think there is some stickiness in core services inflation, which is a problem that you need to be very mindful of? Because when we speak a lot about imported, please finish your word, drink your water. Uh, there's a lot of... You can make your question slightly longer. Uh, <laughs> sir, sir, sir. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I'll take a leaf out of your book from your answer soon. Now, I was saying that there's a lot of focus on imported inflation in discussions on inflation, but I think people speak less about core services inflation. Do you think that could be a fairly significant part of the problem? You see, core inflation is definitely, give me a moment. Of course. You see, core inflation is certainly an area of concern. We have highlighted in the last monetary policy statement, if you see the, uh, the minutes of the, the resolution of the last monetary policy committee meeting, the focus was on core inflation. In my in my policy statement, I had also devoted considerable amount, you know, focus, I had given focus on core inflation. Core inflation still remains sticky around 6%. The number which came out yesterday, core inflation is about 6.1%. The previous month was about 6%. Although the momentum of core inflation within that seems to have slightly moderated, but the point remains that core inflation remains sticky at... Uh, 6% and that is not a very comfortable number to deal with. So therefore, we have to keep, as I said earlier, uh, in my last monetary policy statement, we have to be very vigilant and we have to really keep focus on the core part of the inflation because that is becoming sticky and we have to see, you know, and that is something which has to be dealt with. The supply side measures taken by the government the easing of supply chain bottlenecks uh, internationally and also within India. Uh, I think all these factors will probably have their impact and the monetary policy action taken which we started in May. I think going forward they should start working uh, in a more uh, visible or pronounced manner so far as core inflation is concerned. But at the moment we have to give, you know, continue the focus on uh, core inflation or as I said the Arjuna's eye has to be maintained on you know kept on uh, core inflation. Back to growth uh, you know uh, you spoke about the moderation in demand uh, now if there is a significant sobering of demand in the coming year plus cost of capital goes up for companies could we be saddled at the end of this credit cycle with another set of bad assets like we had in the previous round? NPLs go up again over four or five years. You see, cost of capital, if you have to, you have to see it in real terms. Real terms would be taking into account the inflation. We cannot just go by the nominal number sure. 
of uh, the interest rate. You have to see it as what is the real interest rate, you know, taking into account uh, net of inflation. Now, with regard to your point on bad assets, we have uh, over the last, uh, you know, over the last three to four years, starting with uh, 2019, particularly in the post, a lot of steps have been taken before that. It's, I'm not trying to say that it all happened now. Number of steps have been taken by the RBI over the years. But especially in the last, you know, uh, last three years, post ILFS and post all those bad asset problem which uh, the banks faced, we have really sort of tightened our uh, supervision. And the kind of things which we are now looking at in the banks, in the NBFC sector, we didn't do it earlier. We have developed early warning signals. We are looking into the business models of banks. Our information system in terms of the data that we give, get from the banks, that has become, that has been further improved. So we get, you know, almost on a real-time basis. Real-time is, uh, I think, uh, will be a bit of exaggeration. I would say that it's an ongoing process now. The supervision by RBI is an ongoing process where we keep on not monitoring not only the numbers, but we, within each bank, within each NBFC, particularly the bigger ones, we look at where the credit growth is happening, what is the build-up in bad assets, if any, like, for example, uh, retail credit has picked up over the last one year. We are always mindful of within retail credit is what is the stress level? What is the bad asset level? Bad asset level is 91 days or more of, uh, you know, overdues. But within that, we have in our system, we have overdues which are more than 30 days, due, you know, overdues of more than 60 days. So we monitor that. So the moment we see that in a particular sector or in a particular bank, or, you know, there is some stress is developing, we immediately sort of become alert and there are, we have internal uh, red flagging systems, we have early warning signals, and we immediately flag it to the banks concerned. Is it or at a NBFC. micro level? Sorry? I mean, is it at a bank level also? It is at a bank level. Individual bank level. It is at individual bank level. It is also at the level of individual large NBFCs. Okay. And uh, so we immediately flag the issue. And that is why we have also advised the banks to really make their risk management committees, their audit committees more functional, more, you know, more robust. We have issued some guidelines for that. And we just convey it to the banks and request them that you examine it, go back, discuss in your board, take a view what is happening, take whatever mitigation measures are required, please do take it and inform us. So therefore, I think, there is a great awareness even among the banks. The banks themselves, I am happy to point out that uh, uh, and the banks themselves today are much more concerned about the problem of, uh, uh, you know, rising uh, bad assets. Yeah. So I think overall the whole, uh, you know, the whole banking culture, if I can say, that the prudence, the pr a culture of prudence has developed in the Indian banking sector over the last few years. Going by the metrics that you just spoke about, would something like the ICICI Bank Videocon case have propped up as a red flag alert with the RBI? That too many loans are going to one group, not backed by enough kind of assets. Would, you have, would it have showed up? No, I would not. Uh, let me say that I don't want to comment on a specific case. But it's a very large no, no, case. I don't, it's not proper for me, uh, being the regulator, to comment on a specific case. It's not proper, and I will not comment on any specific would case. Would something I'll like complete. that? Would no, some... I'll just complete. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a specific case of uh, that, uh, you know, I, I'm not commenting on the specific sure. case. But in general terms, I would like to say that, you know, RBI is not sitting in the bank monitoring each and every check payment, monitoring each and every loan sanction. It's not our job. It is the, the bank has got a risk management committee, the bank has a credit sanction committee, the bank has a board of directors, the bank has a senior management, a qualified professional CEO assisted by a lot of senior management. It is their responsibility to do the due diligence. We cannot be looking into the kind of loan appraisal and the due diligence which a bank does in each and every case. That's not our job and that's not desirable. For God's sake, if 
RBI or any regulator in any country gets into those areas, you are uh, completely, you will kill the credit, uh, you know, you will create, uh, you know, it will sort of be highly detrimental to the credit effect. So therefore, individual cases of failure, they could be due to business failure also. There are, you know, situations where there could be business failure also. But individual cases of failure, it's not possible for the Reserve Bank because we cannot put ourselves into the role of an, you know, into the chair of the a credit sanction committee of the bank. So we monitor the overall numbers, we monitor the sectors. We don't really look at individual uh, cases of, uh, you know, how the loan was sanctioned. But yes, if a large portfolio, there is slippage that overdues are building up, if it's a large loan, we would certainly flag it to the bank that, you know, need to focus on these kind of large portfolios. I was, I was hardly blaming you, sir. You, you seem to have taken it personally. I was asking whether it would show up in your searches. I was not blaming the RBI for the ICICI bank video one case at all. No, not that way. I think uh, it needs to be examined. I didn't, did I sound as if I was uh, trying to... No, I, don't, I didn't see it that way. I didn't see it that way. I didn't see it that way at all. What I'm saying is that our systems, you asked whether the system that we have, whether it will be able to focus on, you know, pick up uh, a case like the one yeah, you yeah. mentioned. I, that, in that context, I said that we cannot become the appraisal authority no, in a bank. Sure. To that extent, I just clarified the RBI's role. We look at individual portfolios, and if there is a very large loan and if it is showing signs of stress, naturally it will be noticed. And before us, it is actually the first line of defense in any financial system. The first line of defense has to be the bank management itself. Sure. Let me rephrase the question in a different way on the same subject. Uh, there's a report which came out last week authored by Sucheta Dalal where she points out that in the IDBI bank case, almost all the loans which were made to a group called the Seva Group came from public sector banks. Do you think or would you agree that public sector banks are more susceptible to such kind of dubious loan practices which end up in scams and therefore leading to large NPAs? Or is it an unfair assessment? No, I don't want to comment on individual cases of, uh, you know, what happened in this case, that case. I would not like to comment on that case. The improvement in the banking sector over the last few years is both in the public and private sector. So it will not be fair to just pick up the public sector and say that, you know, this has happened in the public sector. Today, the functioning in the prudent management, you know, the, all the improvement in terms of governance is visible both in public and private sector banks. So it will not be correct to generalize and uh, put uh, all the public sector banks in one, you know, bracket them and put them into one basket. There are, might have been individual instances in individual banks. It will not be correct to generalize on that basis. Okay. My colleagues have a few questions, but before that I want to ask one question on your recent comments on cryptocurrencies. Uh, you made a statement that they might be triggering the next financial crisis. It could come from there. Uh, do you think they should be banned? RBI's position is very clear. It should be banned. All of them. No activity should be allowed in crypto. The technology needs to be supported. The technology of blockchain. blockchain needs to be supported because the technology has got so many other applications. Again, it it will become, a, I can see the clock there, so it will become again a large answer. So I will try to paraphrase it as much as possible. You see, why we are saying it is going to be, apart from the commonly known dangers of, uh, you know, money laundering, terror funding, uh, uh, you know, what are the principal concerns that we have? First thing is, what is crypto? People call it, some people call it as an asset, some people call it as a financial product. But you will agree that every asset, every financial product has to have some underlying. In the case of crypto, there is no underlying. 
and I had said it in some press conference that not even a, a tulip, alluding to the Dutch uh, tulip mania. There is no underlying. The increase in the market price of crypto, you know, various kinds of crypto, which start at a particular price, then it multiplies over, you know, in a matter of few weeks or few months. It is based on a make-believe that this is worth so much or it will go up to such and such level. So anything without any underlying whose valuation is dependent entirely on make-believe is nothing but 100% speculation or to put it very bluntly, it is gambling. Now in our country we don't allow gambling. If you want to allow gambling, treat it as a gambling and lay down the rules for gambling. But that's not a financial product. So therefore, crypto masquerading as a financial product or a, a financial asset is a completely misplaced argument. And the bigger, more macro reason for what we are saying is that you see crypto, so-called crypto assets or cryptocurrencies have the potential, you know, they have the characteristics of becoming a means of exchange. That is, they can become a means of exchange of, of doing a transaction. And most of it is dollar denominated. So if you allow it to grow, assume a situation where 20% of our transactions in the economy, 20% I'm mentioning an ad hoc number, 20% of the transactions in the economy is taking place through cryptos which are not issued by the central bank. It is issued by private companies which are placed all over the world. The Reserve Bank, being the monetary authority of the country as the central bank, will lose control over the money supply in the economy. We will lose control over 20% of the transactions in our economy. Reserve Bank's ability, the central bank's ability to decide monetary policy, to decide on the liquidity of, uh, you know, the level of liquidity that needs to be maintained, the level of money supply, M3, that has to be maintained in the economy, the Reserve Bank's authority to that extent will get undermined. It will lead to a dollarization of the economy. And please believe me, these are not empty alarm signals or empty, you know, I'm getting, this can happen. One year ago, in the Reserve Bank, we had said that this whole thing is likely to collapse sooner than later. And if you see the developments over the last uh, one year, climaxing in the FTX uh, episode, I think I don't need to add anything more. Okay. My colleague Saurav Majumdar from Business Today magazine has a question for you, Mr. Das. Saurav? Yeah. Good evening, Governor. Uh, yeah. Uh, good evening. I just wanted to say, you know, you spoke uh, your views on crypto, which you just elaborated on just now, very well known. Uh, RBI has just rolled out the CBDC. Uh, you know, there is some confusion yet about what the CBDC will do and how it will play out. It will be great if you can just throw some light on what the CBDC exactly will entail. Another little question attached to that is, I mean, not strictly related to CBDC, but about the digital, uh, you know, the whole uh, digital initiatives of banks. Now, they are hugely, uh, you know, under pressure in terms of uh, the core banking, which we discussed earlier uh, in the day course of the discussions. Now, what are the risks you see as the regulator in terms of banks going increasingly digital? And as the regulator, what are you telling them to do? You know, because digital is a, is a given. The digital part, uh, I mean, the systems have to be very robust. The, you know, the basic IT systems of banks uh, will have to be very robust. Data privacy is an issue that has to be adequate safeguards to, I think there are a large number of bankers here. They are much better placed uh, to reply to this question. But let me say that issues of data privacy, issues of robustness of the technology, you know, the IT system itself, the focus has to be on that. And many banks are also actively engaged with many big tech companies. So the challenge to the banks is that this, it should not lead to a situation where the banks, you know, where the big techs come and sort of start dominating the banks. The banks should take their own decisions. 
the bank should not be swallowed by the big techs but the bank should utilize the technology and the service provided by the big techs and they can develop various kinds of uh, partnerships or arrangements etc coming to cbdc's cbdc is uh, a currency it's a currency system people compare it with upi upi is a payment system cbdc is a currency system now it it's just like cash paper currency it is just like paper currency you go to a shop you pay money to the shopkeeper he gives you the whatever you are buying your settlement is done cbdc also it is instant settlement the money the currency digital currency the e rupee will flow from your wallet to the wallet of the merchant without the intermediation of the bank so it will become faster apart from issues of saving on logistics uh, cost cost of printing etc i think cbdc is the you know is is the future money large number of countries are working on cbdcs technology is becoming more and more robust in this area we cannot be left behind we have to be there and it is going to be the shape of future money settlement is going to be quicker so but the technology will have to be very robust and very safe we have to ensure that uh, you know it's not cloned or it's not counterfeited so therefore the trial which we have launched we are being very careful about it there are many experiences many learnings which will which are coming and which will come out of the wholesale and the retail trials which we are doing so i think uh, we are uh, you know we are sort of getting ready for the future one question mr das i should ask you quickly before i ask my colleagues to join in is about the last quarter's current account deficit and the fact that the rupee was doing quite well against other currencies but by the end of the year i think if you look at it versus many other emerging market currencies it's not done that well the, should one be worried about the current account deficit and what it could do to the rupee this year okay now this whole debate of uh, you know it, it's a common way of people uh, saying the day the rupee depreciates uh, or at the end of the year they say that you know rupee is the you worst, know, performing, worst performing currency and all china grew on the back of a weak currency and reached where they are today so if the currency is strong or weak it uh, in you know it 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 has to be seen in relative terms it has to be seen in a proper context so i don't enter into that uh, whether it's a good thing or, or a bad thing yeah. good or bad a weak or strong i'm not entering into that so far as rbi is concerned the rupee is uh, i mean the exchange rate is uh, market driven yeah. now your main question is on the current account deficit the first quarter number this year it's very easy incidentally you know the numbers are quite easy to remember because the first quarter the current account deficit if deficit was 2.2% okay. we have corrected the number it's 2.2% the second quarter became 4.4 and the average for the first half is 3.3 so <laughs> so therefore it's quite easy to remember but in other words on a more serious note the cad the current account deficit for the first half of the year is 3.3% but having said that october and november yeah. the situation has you know is showing great amount of improvement merchandise uh, you know the trade deficit is moderating imports have come down benefiting also from you know the decline in uh, commodity prices on the other hand services exports have picked up and they're doing very well at the moment and uh, uh, the you know that is with regard to the current account deficit so we do expect the current account deficit of the current year to be eminently manageable so far as rbi is concerned and so far as financing of current account deficit is concerned remittances are doing very well the world bank projects that india will receive 100 billion dollars of remittances this year but if you and the growth the world bank has projected 10 or 12% but the first half itself the growth is almost 20% so remittances are doing very well fdi net fdi from uh, you know up to end october has been about uh, 22 billion net fpi up to end of december has been about uh, 11 billion or so 
the figures may be little here and there but broadly these are the numbers so to sum it up i would say that the current account deficit of our you know there is improvement visible it will be manageable eminently manageable financing of it also will be you know is going to be fairly comfortable and the reserves i should also add that our forex reserves which had gone down to 524 billion they have again come back to 562 billion today we would have released by now uh, you know the figure for last friday which is i think 561.5 billion or so and but that's mostly because of revaluation uh, some valuation changes so but still it is in the region of 561 562 billion which in all parameters taking into account all parameters of measurement of adequacy of reserves is very comfortable you know you've been rbi governor for what more than 4 years now mr das if you look at the previous stints of your predecessors the one thing which was common is that almost every 6 months or so there would be some signs of strain between the rbi and the government uh, you know pulls and pressures differences in opinion none of that seems to be visible right now so your admirers or supporters would say that's because you've mastered the art of relationship management with the finance ministry no i mean it as as a compliment but your critics would say that you are too compliant with the government and in that you've sacrificed some of the central bank's autonomy what is the truth between these two i think it's for it's for you to judge no 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 it's for you to judge so no somebody has to tell specifically where the central bank has compromised its autonomy making you know sweeping statements is not fair somebody has to say where we have compromised on our autonomy initially there was this talk of surplus transfer and all that but surplus transfer was driven by was determined and decided by the recommendations of the bimal jalan committee which has been accepted by everybody so it was a mat- it was the calculation which the our accounts department did placed it before the audit committee and that is the surplus number which is coming i have no discretion to increase the surplus transfer or to decrease the surplus transfer it is audited and the numbers are placed in the public domain everybody knows about it autonomy basically means autonomy in decision making i am not commenting on you know any other t- i will just focus on my tenure i think in any institution in any institution whether it is central bank vis a vis the government or it is uh, you know it is between uh, let us say a management of a company with its uh, board of directors in any institution in any organization interface with others requires consultations requires active engagement so without proper engagement there could be areas of communication gap so we should not allow that situation to develop in my first press conference when i took over in december 2018 i had said that my approach would be consultative and i will constantly engage with the government to explain to the government why we have done uh, you know why we have done what we have done that does not mean that i have compromised our position but i think as the government the government should know the background of important decisions when we do for example the uh, monetary policy increases we have been able to do it nobody has uh, prevented us uh, nobody has stopped us from doing it contrary to what may be the perception outside we have done what we wanted to do the monetary policy committee constituted by the government monetary policy committee did uh, discussions i mean took decisions so i think ultimately at the end of the day what is important is to maintain good communication and to constantly engage i think that engagement and that communication between the government and the rbi is very important having said that it's not as if there have not been any differences of opinion on certain individual issues but all those issues have been internally resolved through discussions one question from my colleague siddharth zarabi siddharth mike mike uh, you, governor you spent a lot of time in north block and now at min street as we call it uh, and you covered a lot of ground in this interaction my question is very simple going forward is monetary policy going to be a t20 a one day or a test match and i ask this question because many in the audience may perhaps know you have some interest in cricket 
So I uh, use that opportunity to pose that question to you. I have great interest in cricket. <laughs> so we can hold another session on cricket if you wish. But, uh, you know, having worked in the North Block, I think what is also important is that, uh, I mean, I know the corridors of North Block. I know which, uh, you know, corridor takes a right bend where or a left bend where. Now I'm familiar in the Reserve Bank, so I can close my eyes and enter into Reserve Bank and reach my office. I know where we to take a turn. So on a more serious note, I think uh, you cannot uh, classify it as a T20 or a uh, T, you know, limited over 50. Or the, you see, Virat Kohli is good in T20. He is good in uh, limited over one day cricket. He is also good in test cricket. So the RBI has to function and perform both in a T20 match, in a 50 over match, as well as in a test cricket. Our effort, <laughs> our effort and endeavor is always to optimize our performance to the best extent that we can. We put our best foot forward. Governor, we are out of time, but thank you very much for a great session. And thank you very much for accepting our invitation today. A great pleasure talking to you today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for your patient hearing. I think we have overshot the time, That's all right. primarily for my, I think, longish answers, but I thought it was necessary. I can see your colleagues are getting very impatient. But thank you once again. Thank you very much for inviting